to present Austin Faith Dialogue, brought to you by the Austin Metropolitan Ministries. In the weeks ahead, you will see these and other programs by various denominations. <laughs> Faith Dialogue, a public affairs series at the crossroads of religion and life. Austin Faith Dialogue highlights the interaction of the religious community with the social and cultural issues in the area in and around the capital city. Austin Faith Dialogue is brought to you by Austin Metropolitan Ministries in cooperation with KTBC TV. Join us now for this week's edition of Austin Faith Dialogue. Christians and Jews, the mandates are clear. Feed the hungry in your midst. People of all faiths find the target of stamping out starvation and hunger a goal worthy of the faithful. In the Austin area, creative and innovative ways have been tried and proven as efficient ways of addressing the need. Yet there is more to be done. Hello, I'm Valerie Bridgman Davis, co-pastor of Banal Full Community Church and your host for today's edition of Austin Faith Dialogue. Today, three members of the Austin area have gathered to give us an update of the war on poverty here. Please welcome my guest, Barry Abels, Assistant Director of the Capital Area Food Bank, Lenora Yant, Director of Hill Country Community Ministries, and Carl Sigenthaler with Crop Walk. Thank you all for being here with us. It's good to have you. Uh, we have had a previous conversation, uh, to say that for the benefit of our viewers, and so they might hear us say, you said earlier, and they don't know where that came from, so we, I'm warning them beforehand. All right, and relax. <laughs> it's good to have you all here. I wanted to start by giving our viewers a chance to know how you got here, what it is you do, and what we're going to be doing today. So I'm going to start with Barry, just because you're nearest right to here. me, and you are with the capital area food right um, well I came to Austin several years ago like so many to attend UT and uh, fell into doing social services working with runaway children and family problems uh, due to economic necessity got into the business world and decided after a few years that social services is where I needed to be and there was an opportunity at the food bank and uh, that's been about four years now it's been a wonderful place to be great we'll talk about what it is the food bank does sure. in a few minutes and Lenora you are with Hill Country Ministries which is out in Leander. in Leander, and how did you fall into that? Um, I went to work for Hill Country Ministries uh, in December of um, 82, mm -hmm. and I worked there with Phil Unger uh, until he retired. And that was? Um, it's been several years ago. Okay. Back in 70-something. Oh, okay. And then I've been there ever since, and we feed the hungry. Been there ever since and loving every minute of it. Yes. And Carl, your face will look familiar to several of our viewers. Yes, I came to Austin in 1974 and came to uh, teach at the Presbyterian Seminary and then to direct what became Metro Ministries of Austin. And Metro Ministries was the, uh, in a sense, an umbrella among uh, religious groups that included faith food pantries, Meals on Wheels, and so forth. So uh, very early, very interested in this field for sure. Good. So today we want to talk about the war on hunger. We, that's what we're calling it. And the question that came up as we were talking earlier was how Texas ranks as far as meeting the needs of the hungry in our midst. And I think you had a figure for us, Barry, of how we're doing. Well, um, in actuality, uh, we rank total in terms of services to individuals in need, you know, down in the, the high 40s, one of the lowest of all states from my understanding. And uh, what that means is that we as, as folks in the nonprofit community have uh, a real big job to do to try and provide food and other services to folks who are in need of it. Right now in uh, the Travis County area, you know, we're looking at over 100,000 folks that live 
below or at federal poverty guidelines, which is, I think, something like $12,000 for a family of four people. Mm. Pretty minimal amount. Yeah. We talked a little bit on that line of that, but even with Texas being on the low end, that Austin ranks uh, as a community really high in the giving toward foods. I don't, just kind of hop in here, anybody that wants to. Well, we had the report uh, that last year, the uh, crop walk, for instance, drew people from uh, roughly 100 uh, congregations and four other nondescript groups or other kinds of groups and uh, raised uh, an, an amount of money that was about third highest in uh, Texas, and we're not certainly the third largest city, and among the top 10 in the nation. So there is a, a broad response to this kind of need here. And there are many uh, not-for-profit voluntary efforts uh, in the field. One of the problems is in developing an effective network among those and helping people to understand that they are even available. Okay, I'm gonna jump Lenora in here in a minute, but I wanna start by letting Barry explain what it is the food bank does. Sure. The food bank is an agency that works to collect and then distribute food and personal care products throughout the Central Texas area. And the way we do this is by a, a national network relationship we have with an organization called Second Harvest and through our own local efforts, securing donations of foods that would otherwise be wasted or are contributed by the community in food drives that we have. As a matter of fact, one coming this spring, sponsored by Channel 7. Um, we bring this product in, we sort it through it, we take care of looking at anything that may not be fit for consumption, and then we make it available to over 140 different organizations in Central Texas, one of which is Hill, Hill Country Cunch Community Ministries, exactly. Which, which is a good way for you to get in here, Lenora. <laughs> Tell us what you do at Hill Country Community. Uh, we feed the hungry. Um, How do you do that? To, uh, by getting food from the churches that support us. We have 30 churches that support us. And then um, we get from the Capital Area Food Bank, which is a great big help. And what do people do to get food from you? I mean, they come in. They come in and we fill out a little form with their name and then we keep track of how many times they come in and um, we we'll just give them the food and can uh, of course this is very particular to hill country ministries so i mean it might be a little bit different in other places but do people repeatedly come back or do they some do and sometimes they'll just come one time but then there's some that just don't make enough to make it and so we help them with food good um, we did talk about that there are different sure. kinds of way of handling sure. that. And you, you talked earlier about that being very different than, say, applying for food stamps. Well, of course, uh, the mission of most of these organizations is to try and help people out with an immediate need, uh, especially if it's a pantry like Hill Country or one of the other pantries around the community. And Tell that, us some of the groups. Well, there. we've got uh, the... Uh, faith food pantries, which are two or three food pantries where a social worker or other kind of caseworker can call up and get a bag of groceries for a client. There's the uh, Loaves and Fishes Austin Baptist Chapel Soup Kitchen over uh, just off of I-35 and First Street that serves hot meals. Of course, the Salvation Army, Meals on Wheels, and of course, organizations like the Center for Battered Women or Austin Family House, which is a recovery organization for uh, women and children, women who are having uh, recovery from alcohol or drug abuse. Mm -hmm. A lot of these organizations are trying to get people back on their feet. So we provide them with food. They don't have to worry about where's a lot of the product going to come from. And more of their budget can go into providing services, not just that next meal. Good. One of the things we talked about uh, when we were all talking earlier was that there's this hidden hunger factor. And Carl, you had something to say about that. So let's kind of talk about who that might apply to to well, use that phrase, hidden hunger. Mm -hmm. One of the things uh, churches around the city are doing are these uh, caregiver groups. And uh, what they're very interested in is discovering where the isolated, frail, elderly people are that uh, are forgotten by their family or their family's moved away or they're the last survivor in their family, something like that. Uh, otherwise, people you know that are really lost out there very often have given up on themselves, sometimes say, um, oh, I'm not worth it, don't go to any trouble kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's finding, especially, say, folks like that in their own homes that need some uh, assistance. And then uh, we've also been in contact with, for instance, uh, through the churches and some of the efforts of Wayne Samaritano, uh, Casa Marianella, and so forth, 
in touch with people that are that are migrating into this area very often without uh, English language on their side, without knowing the ropes, if you will, you know, in the Austin community or the Austin culture, and in a sense helping them then to be in touch with what the resources are, not only for the immediate food, but then also for jobs, for literacy training, for getting a hold on the language and so forth, to help them along to, to their own development to become self-sufficient on their own. One of the things you mentioned was how people find out. Lenore, how do people find out about Hill Country Ministries? Through our churches and through clients, they tell each other just... Kind of word of right. mouth. And how many do you serve on a monthly basis? Do you have any sense of that? Um, yes, about 400 and something families. That's that's incredible amount for... And. Um, some of them are large families, mm -hmm. real large. What, what about getting the word out, Barry? How do we do that? Well, uh, of course, word of mouth in this kind of a uh, situation is quite effective. Uh, one thing people can do, however, is to call us at the food bank. And although an individual would not come to us, we would then ask what part of town they live in or what outlying area. And we will give them the addresses and numbers of various organizations that can serve them and we'll be able to give them four or five different referrals of organizations that want to help. We talked earlier about how you get donations, how the food bank gets uh, funding, how individual groups get funding. Certainly the crop walk depends on, I guess, taking um, kind of a pledge and then people walk and right. go for Walkers it. Walkers get pledges from people who want to sponsor them and each uh, donor or each sponsor contribute so much, say, per kilometer. It's a 10-kilometer walk, although this year we have a, a shorter route for those that would like to do just the five kilometers, mm -hmm. and I assume they'll work that out with their <laughs> sponsors. Uh, and then so much per kilometer, and then that is contributed. And then 100% of that from uh, in Austin, raised in Austin, does go into the uh, both the relief services here, about 25% here, and then the other 75% goes and is distributed internationally, where the most severe hunger, of course, is occurring around our world. Mm -hmm. Our focus uh, this year internationally has been on, the, in effect, on the Horn of Africa, mm -hmm. which is uh, East Africa, uh, Somalia, Sudan, and Ethiopia, where the uh, hunger and starvation is severe, a combination of famine, of drought, and then perpetual warfare and civil wars going on that really upset people being able to to uh, fend for themselves. You talked about there being a kind of a upgrade at giving whenever that is uh, visible in the press, whenever people hear that there's either famine, drought, hunger in a particular area in the world. How is it affected when the press isn't covering hunger? Well, I think that's... Tell uh, them the truth now. <laughs> <laughs> that can be a problem. Uh, what people seem to forget is that hunger is persistent, it's year-round. And when we have the holiday season come around, people are generous. They want to give, they want to help. And they don't necessarily forget, but they don't keep it on the forefront of their mind that people are hungry every single day. So when you have a food drive like we do at the food, uh, food bank or the crop walk comes around, people go, aha, they're prompted. They've got something to remind them. I think that's why you see so many programs about uh, the children who are hungry and the distended bellies and things like that on television all the time. So you have to keep that information out in front. You use the phrase manufacturing perception of need and I, I, I kind of wanted to piggyback on that because I think I said earlier that it, I really do forget. I mean it really isn't that I think about it. I mean because there are 50 million things pressing in on me, and Carl said at least that many, but pressing in on me, and you just forget because there sure. are so many other things to give to. But Lenore, when you are down, when y'all get down on donations, how do you generate help? Uh, by the churches and private donations, and we have a thing called the Thankful Thousand that helps us. The Thankful Thousand, or the, and tell me what that is. Uh, anyone that pays $10 a month. Anyone for the that pays $10. Mm -hmm. dollars. And where would they send that to? To Hill Country Community Ministries. Yeah. Uh, Post Office Box 1064, Leander. Post Office Box 1064, Leander, 786441. 
as long as we're giving it, we want some. <laughs> oh, okay. You know, but that's the thing. I think so many of our organizations depend on people who are regular givers who keep that in the forefront. Uh, but it's a real challenge to get out there and tell people what's going on. And there are so many competing needs because you've got cancer and you've got uh, heart disease and you've got, of course, the AIDS situation right now, all legitimate, all needs that have got to be met. Something so basic as hunger, as poverty, is such a persistent thing. And it's not the kind of thing where we're going to be able to do a bunch of research and find a cure. Right. You know, I mean, what do you do when people say, uh, well, they're a bunch of bums, they don't want to work, they, I mean, because I know you hear this, what I got them moving. <laughs> what do you say when people say that, Carl? Well, you have to find out, uh, talk about peop real people, uh, actual people, people that you've worked with, uh, people that have uh, either come to you or that you've reached out to and, in effect, tell their stories. Maybe it's that they've just had uh, a major medical expense within their family, and it's almost a choice of whether they're going to be paying that medical bill, which is already upon them, or whether they're going to eat. And uh, some people have some very, very hard choices. Or with shoes the way they are, with, with kids in your family, you have to decide whether they're going to get their their, uh, I don't know, Jordan shoes or something like that, or whether they're going to be able to eat. Any real problems, though, when people have dilemmas, and food very often is one of the things that people, in a sense, skimp on, and it's too bad, you know, if they're very, very limited in means. And then there are people that recently have lost their jobs, or both parents, say, in a household, having lost their jobs, and people that are on the verge of being homeless, or indeed are homeless, that are in our, within our community. So there are folks and people that are struggling, you see, as, uh, that don't have a long history of dependency upon the society, but are struggling. And very sure. often it's a matter of helping them through that really tough period. There was a young couple that, that contacted us yesterday, uh, early 20s perhaps. They recently both got jobs, minimum wage jobs. They have a child. Well, they've applied for food stamps, but gosh, they're off in the ozone somewhere and there's a delay. They won't have them for a few days. They're not going to get paid for another week. But they've got to eat tonight, and they've got a child to feed. These are the kinds of folks that need help once, twice. They're not going to be dependent upon a system. But even if they're both working at minimum wage jobs, they're not going to make it. Well, they're certainly not going to eat well. No, they're not. And the choice is going to come. Do we pay the electric bill? You know, as Carl was talking about, do we buy some shoes or are we going to buy food? You know, well, you want to keep the roof over your head, so you may skip that meal. Yeah. You know, and then if you've got an elderly person or a child who's trying to go to school and needs to think, and they didn't get breakfast, and they, they didn't get the, the, the uh, breakfast at school for some reason, you know, I mean, it's a cycle. I think one of the uh, best ways to do something about it during the off seasons, you know, off Thanksgiving, off Christmas, is to be a volunteer. And most of the uh, organizations supported that are here now use volunteers a great deal. And you can volunteer year-round and, and be helpful and very often interact then with the people for whom you're, you know, providing the care, the people who are hungry and so forth. You can work at the food bank. We have our youth group come down there once in a while and so forth. You can work certainly with Hill Country Ministries. You could work at El Buen Samaritano on the south side, at House of Hope on the east side. Uh, there are many ways yeah. that you can really... Lenore, you're not going to get in here. Well, I was going to ask home. her, that's <laughs> the one thing. How many, how many people do you feed and how many paid people do you have? We don't have any paid people. Exactly. You don't have any paid staff? No. Okay. It's all volunteer. And you feed 400 families a month. Mm -hmm. And some and of these families... More. And sometimes more. And some of these families are 10 people strong. Right. Or more. So you get volunteers again through the churches there in the Hill Country. That, yes, ma'am. And do you have regular volunteers? Uh, sometimes, yes. We do have regulars that come on certain days. Um, Mondays and Thursdays and Wednesday we have regulars. Uh, and when are you most likely to get food out? Or is that just Every a steady? Every day from the time we open at 9 o'clock till we close. Every day, all Every day, day long. Yes, ma'am. What time do you close? Uh, we're open from 9 to 12, 1 to 3. Okay. Let me toot your horn. Now, Kepler Area Food Banks has 143, is that right? Approximately. Um, groups that distribute food for them. And Hill Country Community Ministries is the top distributor. 
Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Tell us where you came from to get to be the top food distributor. <laughs> uh, well, we started out with them. I don't even know when. But, it's but even before years. you got on with the food bank? Well, before we got on with the food, uh, food bank. Well, we just uh, bought whatever we had, like beans and macro cheese and macaroni, um, canned meat, and and we get that's what we gave. And you were giving that out of an August building. Where were you? <laughs> right. Somebody's garage, it, it, is that right? Uh, well, they did start it out of a garage. And then they rented a place. And it got blew up, and they rented another one, or bought another building. And now we're on property that we that the ministries own, and we have several buildings. So uh, from the very first time, you were just serving just oh, trickle of people. Oh, if we had three or four or five a day, we had a big day. Now sometimes we have as many as 100. We have had 150 in one day. Mm. That says something about, I guess, our economy as well, what's going on for people. We have talked about this a little bit, that uh, the con economy is shaky or people are making money but not enough money. When we talked about hidden hunger, I think I used to phrase it, sometimes people will eat two meals a week. Uh, that's certainly not very nourishing. Uh, I, I have friends who would say, well, fasting's good for you, but I'm not sure that for a consistent diet. Voluntary fasting tends volunt to be better for you than involuntary yeah, fasting. Yeah, it's much better than involuntary fasting. So there, there's some sense in which maybe something's going on in the community that we also need to address. And we talked about the giving the fish versus the teaching the fish and just kind of hop in here, anybody. Well, one of the things that I want to make sure we did pay attention to is community gardens. And they have yes. green spots and dotted, I don't know how many about now, about 14 or 15, say, scattered in neighborhoods. And it gives people of all ages, as a matter of fact, an opportunity to get together with the soil again to grow vegetables and so forth that they can both uh, supplement their own diets with healthfully and then share with their neighbors. And it's a, a real good opportunity for people to help themselves and to do it in a community. It's community building. It's it's great, great experience of the relationship to the earth. So that people get a chance to actually participate in their own feeding rather than receiving handout. That has something to do, I think, with dignity as well. Did sure. you want to say something? Well, I was just going to say, in addition to that, uh, one of the things that we're happy about at the food bank is that there are a number of our organizations that are involved in other things besides just feeding someone or giving them a bag of groceries. There are organizations that are helping to get people back on their feet, whether they're folks that have been uh, mentally impaired in some way or physically impaired and they're in a community organization to try and teach independent living or recovering folks trying to get back on their feet, uh, battered wives, whatever the situation is, many of our organizations are working to get people ahead and making sure that in this case food is not the thing that's on their mind, not that next meal, but how am I going to break the cycle? How am I going to move ahead in my life? Good. Carl, um, the crop walk is April the 14th, is that right? And Sunday the 14th. Sunday, April the There's an the 14th. alternate walk the preceding day for those that prefer to do it on the Saturday rather than the Sunday. Okay, April the 13th. That Saturday. Saturday. And the, the 14th is the main one. It'll be taking off from uh, Houston Tillotson College. Mm -hmm. We gather for registration beginning at about 2.15, mm -hmm. and there's going to be music and so forth by real live bands. And uh, then the, the walk itself begins about 3 o'clock. And the walk is from Houston Tillotson, uh, roughly uh, north up to, through Blackland, down south toward the lake, and then back up toward Houston Tillotson. It's a very good walk. It, it itself is very, very impressive with regard to uh, people that obviously are struggling valiantly, you know, in, in very tough situations. And how may people get involved at this late date with Crop Walk? I think the best way to do is to call either the Austin Metropolitan Ministries, a number of which you will see on your screen, right. or, or Church World Service Crop, which has a regional office here, the number again, which you will be able to see on the, on the screen. Mm -hmm. And is, that, is there any volunteers you need to help well, anything? it's interesting. Optimists are helping us monitor, especially at those dangerous crossings on the streets. Mm -hmm. We're going to have some others helping with, uh, I think, a group from the University of Texas, uh, a service organization 
University. It's going to help with parking at Houston Tillotson College right. and so forth. We need people at rest stops that can be helpful there with children, with adults, and helping them to find their way, you know, at the rest stop. So yes, volunteers are needed, but more than anything else, I think we'd like people to sign up to be walkers, to get sponsors, to raise funds right. for Capital Area Food Bank, for El Buen Samaritano. <laughs> Do they have to uh, have a pledge House form? Hope. Where can they get a pledge form from? Well, they want to do that then through the crop, Church World Service crop office. Okay. Well, I think uh, the other thing is uh, if they attend a church, they might want to call their church, and they may be participating oh, indeed. and right. indeed. not be aware of it. Over right. 100 churches are yeah, participating. Churches, synagogues, right. and the like. Yeah. Right. Good. Lenora, last plug here for Hill Country Ministries. Is there something for that neighborhood you really want them to know? You got it shot at it. Well, we just need their help to keep doing what we're doing. Is that with volunteers as well as food stuff? Yes. Okay. All right. And Barry for food bank? Well, the uh, thing that's most upcoming, uh, in addition to volunteer needs year-round, is our uh, annual Spirit of Sharing food drive. That's going to begin, uh, I guess it's the 22nd of April and will be uh, lasting approximately a week. We'll have reception barrels at all Austin area fire stations and manned fire stations in uh, Williamson and Hayes County as well. Uh, it's a very successful way for us to get canned food and uh, notoriety for what's going on in the community. And are you always looking for organizations, groups, churches, we somebody need help to distribute? year round to help us box food, to sort through it, to get it ready for distribution. Is there any particular area in the city that needs more distributors than maybe another? Um, if people are interested in becoming distributors, either through their church or other kinds of nonprofit organizations, we'd love to hear from them. Uh, there are niches that could be filled throughout the community. Great. Good. Well, I think that maybe we've given people a glimpse of what the hunger relief is like in Austin. I'm not sure whether we've done a good job of letting them see who the people are, but I hear your heart, and so I'm really hoping that other people will hear it as well, because this is certainly an important work, I think. It's certainly important to all of us that we be in community with the people in our life. As we come to a close of today's program, I really want to thank you, Barry. Abels and Lenore Yant and Carl Sigenthaler for your participation in our discussion today. I'm trusting that you'll get some feedback from our community. On behalf of Austin Faith Dialogue, I'm Valerie Bridgman Davis, thanking you for watching and inviting you to join us next week at this same time. Peace to you.